Um, I'm also going to launch a poll, which kind of gives us um, an idea of everybody's backgrounds or interests, you know, why it allows us to get to know you a little bit better and hopefully tailor this to um, what applies to your skill sets and what, what you're looking to take away from this conversation today. All right, so most of you have voted, so I'm gonna go ahead and share these results. Um, and it looks like uh, we've got a, a good amount of homebrewers, which is awesome. Um, and then we've got um, all in all a lot of uh, beer professionals. So whether it looks like some brewers, um, some on the service side, sales side, um, and then other as well. Awesome. Uh, so my name's Eric Fowler. Um, if you've joined any of these before, um, you've likely seen me. Um, but I am the education manager at White Labs. Um, these webcasts are, are monthly. We've been doing some bi-monthly um, and have been getting a lot of awesome guests like we have Pat here today. Uh, but what we've really been doing is trying to focus on different aspects of fermentation. So, uh, you know, White Labs being primarily a yeast manufacturing company, um, views fermentation um, from many different aspects of what we do. Uh, we look at it from the propagation side, so making the yeast, to the fermentation side and actually using it uh, with White Labs Brewing Co. or um, a lot of our partner breweries that we work with or a lot of home brewers. Uh, but we also look at general um, education and how to communicate fermentation. Fermentation can be a very dense topic. And depending on who you're communicating, it to what their skill set is, what their interests are. Um, sometimes the vernacular you use can be different. Um, sometimes the um, lens that you're looking at it can be very different. So what we've been doing with these webcasts is uh, pulling a lot of experts in very relatable uh, fields and positions to see how they look at fermentation. Uh, what we have today is uh, uh, Pat Fahey, Master Cicerone and Contact Director. Um, of the Cicerone Certification Program. And Pat, will you give us a little bit of insight to who you are, who Cicerone is, and, and what fermentation maybe means to, to you personally and, and professionally? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eric. So uh, like Eric said, I work for the Cicerone Certification Program. We do certification and education primarily for people who work within the beer industry. Um, traditionally, we've done certifications geared at people who serve and sell beer. Uh, and several different levels of the program, going from the lowest certified beer server up to the highest master Cicerone, covering similar topics at each level of the program, but in increasing levels of depth as you go up the chain. And so obviously fermentation being so integral to beer, uh, that's something that gets touched on at every single level, but it, it's very different as you move from the first level to the top level of the program. Um, and I'll kind of, you know, I'll offer some insight in various places today as to what we look for. But one general way to frame it um, is that when we talk about fermentation at Cicerone, we're always talking through the lens of flavor. What or and I expand flavor to mean any impact that the yeast and the fermentation has on the overall characteristics of the beer. So we don't necessarily get really deep into the science of fermentation in the lower levels of the program. And as you move on in the program, we do start to cover some of those more technical topics, but always with a focus of being able to tie it back to like, okay, well, why does this matter from a, how it makes the beer taste? So do you see at, do you see aspects of fermentation within the different levels of the program and curriculum and, and different types of testing as one of the biggest hurdles? Uh, you know, I took my Cicerone, uh, my certified Cicerone exam in, I believe, 2012. Uh, and I admittedly didn't know a whole lot about fermentation at the time. I mean, I, I knew a decent amount and more than most people, but... Um, you know, through home brewing and through some exposure um, of, of nano brewing, but it, I feel like I probably could have expanded on it um, a little bit more, but do you see that as a hurdle, um, even, even when just looking at the flavor side and where those flavors come from? Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen in Cistern over the years is that it's really hard to predict what 
it's hard to state generally what like a hurdle for people is because you know, we cover a broad range of different topics on the exam from service and handling to beer and food pairing, ingredients in production. And so what I generally find to be the case is that what people find most difficult in the exams is often just the topic that they've been exposed to the least. So somebody who has a fair amount of experience to the brewing process, brewing process elements of the exams probably present less of a hurdle than, uh, than perhaps other topics would versus somebody who doesn't have any brewing experience. That might be something they really have to brush up on. Um, I would say in general, beer styles are the biggest hurdle for people just because there's so much there. But, you know, once again, yeast plays a really important role in shaping the flavor profile of so many different beer styles. So it, it it's interconnected. It plays in for sure. Sure. Yeah. And we can um, get into some of those more specifics um, in a little bit, but yeah, I guess I, I'm always personally surprised when I hear people um, say the beer and food uh, element is one of the most difficult for them when um, to me, it's like you, you're almost just not thinking about what you're already consuming because you're most ex exposed to the beer and food part in your day-to-day -day lives. You're just disconnecting it saying, I'm not studying right now. So I'm not going to think about this peanut butter jelly and this uh, Modelo that I'm drinking, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so what we're going to kind of talk about and, and break it down is the what, the how, and the why. So what I mean by the what is we're going to talk about the specific microorganisms. We're going to be pretty broad. Um, you can get in the weeds quite a bit, but really 99% of beer are brewed with um, two species of yeast. So that's mostly what we'll cover. Um, but we'll talk about where they're used in brewing, um, the how, so how those uh, microorganisms are used to ferment a product, in this case, beer. Um, and then the why, which um, as Pat said, is uh, something that I also feel is, is the most important is um, how it makes the beer taste, what the finished product is like. Uh, you know, when something goes well, it's not that often that our um, partner breweries that we work with come back and say, oh, this beer is awesome with this strain. But when something goes wrong, you know, you it, it amplifies and you hear it a lot. Well, that strain stalled out. Was it due to the conditions? Was, you know, was it the, the wrong growth medium? Was it um, inadequate oxygen? Was your fermentation temperature off? What was there a contamin contaminating organism there? What was the issue? Uh, but I think looking at being able to identify um, those positive attributes um, and how they define a beer style, which I would argue, you know, yeast defines every beer style, um, whether people think about it or not. Uh, but the impact um, on even the amount of expression sometimes um, can make or break um, the accuracy of a beer style or just how it tastes, right? You know, we, we get so hung, hung up on um, accuracy of beer styles, but at the end of the day, um, studying and testing aside, who cares if it tastes good? And uh, there's so many new styles that are using different types of yeast and different fermentation techniques that break the mold. And it's sometimes hard to um, know what's a, what style is going to stick around and what's not, right? Uh, you look at brute IPAs, for instance, you know, it kind of <laughs> looked like for a couple months that that was going to be something that really needed to start being ingrained when we're talking about beer styles. And there's probably people on this call today that are like, what the hell's a brood IPA? Yeah, yeah I didn't, uh, that one always seemed like it was going to be a flash in the pan to me, but <laughs> yeah. here, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so, you know, the what, when we're talking about microorganisms, we're really talking about yeast. Um, there are some beer styles that are um, drastically influenced by bacteria as well. And when we're talking about that, we're really looking at acid production, some flavor, but we're really talking about um, acidity, right? So you can probably name a couple um, sour beer styles off the top of your head. And there's a great chance that those are heavily influenced by bacteria. But we're looking at uh, yeast breaking down into two categories. So ale and lager yeast, uh, ale being um, the original brewing species, meaning it's been around for a long time. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae uh, and lager yeast Saccharomyces pastorianus. So Pat, I'd be interested to hear your take on this, but 
you know, the age old question is what's the difference between an ale and a lager? Uh, what's your, your elevator pitch for explaining that to people? So, you know, I, I get asked this a lot, especially, you know, it's something we always cover in our even like certified beer server level courses, just because it is one of the most common questions that people ask. And we typically will reference some of the, you know, when you ask the average person the, that question, they usually come back at you with like brewing trivia. They're like, well, you know, ale is top fermenting and lager is bottom fermenting or like ales ferment warmer typically than lagers. And all of that stuff is true. But once again, we always try to bring it back to a focus on flavor. So at the lower levels, what we typically will tell people is just the easiest way to think of it is ale yeast are more likely to produce esters or fruity sorts of notes in beer, whether that's, you know, things like apple, pear, uh, banana, peach, those sorts of things. Whereas lager yeast typically don't contribute very much character to a beer through fermentation. And it's, it's one of those things I remember when I took organic chemistry in, in college, like, and took a lot of organic chemistry in college, cause that was my focus. Like when I got beyond the first year, um, one of my teachers was like, you know, that first year of organic chemistry is like, we're just lying to you about everything we say, because we have to oversimplify things in order for you to even be able to take it in. And so like, every time I give that spiel on ale versus lager, it's like, well, but you know, loggers in some circumstances will produce esters and they do they are more prone to imparting certain sulfur flavors to beer so like it's not quite that simple obviously but the general breakdown especially that we teach at the lower levels just to simplify it for people is like lager yeast you're not going to get from you're not going to get fermentation flavors from lager yeast typically ale yeast you can expect those fruity characteristics and then some POF positive strains will also give you spicy phenolic notes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's the whole process aspect of it too, right? Can you lager an ale? Sure. Does it make it a lager? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what country you're in. Yeah. And, and you and I have judged a lot of beer and, you know, there's a good chance that we've had something entered into a lager category mm -hmm. that's probably fermented a little bit warmer with a lager strain or cooler with an ale strain and then lager and at the end of the day, uh, I think you're spot on that, you know, it depends how it tastes because blind and without understanding what the beer is or what the process was, none, none of this really matters. A lot of people are doing um, lager-esque beers um, with Kvike strains. And, you know, I think it can be, you know, when you try a, a true, truly lagered beer and something that's you know been lagered for months and fermented very very cool that's easy to identify but there's a big gray area outside of that that there can be a lot of wiggle room yeah i would say the same thing with like really care like nobody's going to mistake a hefeweizen or any belgian style of beer for a lager but like there's all sorts of beer made with american ale yeast that the yeast character is so minimal that it's like, it's kind of falls somewhere in the middle. It's hard to say just from, from tasting blind. Mm -hmm. But from a, um, a yeast supplier standpoint, right. And an ale is made with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, lager is made with Saccharomyces pastorianus. And that's kind of how I explain it. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of the conditions that you said, like being top fermenting, uh, the temperature ranges, you know, are all, um, kind of conditional outside of that because if you look at Saccharomyces cerevisiae and, and ale strains well conical fermenters are meant to push yeast to the bottom so most ales you know people are even talking about trying to harvest from blow off and, and you hear this from a lot of home brewers but on a larger scale that hydrostatic pressure and the, the design of those fermenters are actually fermenting towards the bottom so yeah it, top top fermenting and bottom fermenting these days is kind of a it's a funny distinction it's it's more of like a historical distinction at this point than anything <laughs> yeah that's very fair um and then for wild yeast and bacteria uh when we're talking about wild yeast in brewing we're generally talking about Britannomyces or brett um you'll see it um described as decora sometimes um but there are many types of wild yeast. Um, there are not many lab grown types of wild yeast. Uh, and really um, you're gonna see those in a lot of like 
farmhouse and wild beers, right? And then um, lactic acid bacteria. So you're talking about um, lactobacillus and pediococcus. Lactobacillus is really what we're gonna, what you're gonna see a lot of. And interestingly enough, um, a, a lot of those strains that are used have been sourced from um, other uh, types of manufacturing, such as yogurt and uh, the temperature tolerance. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and then your acetic acid bacteria, your um, acetobacter and gluconobacter are going to be more um, that next step, right? You're going to see those in very small quantities. Um, you'll find those wild a lot. Uh, in, in mixed cultures and spontaneous fermented beers. Um, how, like how, in how much detail and how geeky um, do some of the different levels get with that, those next type of beer styles, right? Maybe not these specific types of bacteria and wild yeast, but uh, those beer styles that might have influence from those, any, any organism essentially outside of ale and lager yeast. I mean, we talk about goose, not, we don't, talk broadly about lambic beer, but the specific qualities of goose, uh, even at certified beer server. So even at that level, you know, we're expecting people, do you have to be able to identify at certified beer server? Like these flavors are coming from Britannomyces? No, but like having at least a loose understanding of, of how I mean, we don't test too much on brewing process at the first level, but understanding that fermentative organisms are what is causing the sour and kind of funky flavors in those styles is something that we'll even test people on at the first level. Now, like actually getting deeper into what the organisms are, are doing is definitely something we only really start to touch on at certified Cicerone and then at advanced and master Cicerone, it gets a little bit more in depth. Uh, so let's briefly just look at, I, I like showing this graph to visualize what's actually happening in fermentation. Uh, I think, you know, if, if somebody understood this, this chart and was able to articulate it, you probably could answer a lot of the questions on, on some of the lower levels of the exam, right? Like what's being produced during a fermentation? I mean, in all honesty, this sort of timeline would go way above and beyond what we were what we were looking at, especially at those lower levels. In that, you know, it's at the lower levels, we're not talking about how many cells are in suspension. That's not something that. Yeah. Okay. That that one's fair. This <laughs> I bring over from other classes, but yeah. Yeah, but but yes, I mean, a general understanding that like. Uh, I would say that the two most important lines in there that hopefully people are able to develop an intuitive understanding of is during fermentation, gravity goes down, ethanol goes up. Like at the, at it's at its core, like that is what we'd want people to understand early on pH drop. That's probably not even something we'd cover at certified Cicerone level, just because it is more of a production focused thing, but could show up on higher levels. Mm -hmm. And and what we're really looking at here is um, you look at that purple line and let's say gravity, what is gravity, right? It's the amount of sugar that's present and adding that yeast, it's going to actually um, metabolize that sugar into other byproducts. And there's a lot of byproducts and there's a lot that's not represented um, in this timeline here, but you're as the yeast begin converting that sugar and it drops. And, you know, here for this example, we're looking at six days, which is pretty common for most beer styles and most fermentation, let's say most ales, right? Uh, it's producing, like it's, it's converting that into something, right? And it's converting that into a lot more yeast, which as you said, probably isn't um, as relevant for those exams, but it's, is a byproduct that's often um, overlooked quite a bit. Uh, but it's, really what we're looking at is um, ethanol, so alcohol, and then a lot of CO2, right? So it's producing um, ethanol as your primary alcohol and then CO2, but it's also uh, in return lowering the pH, which is going to create stability, which we'll talk about in a second. So yeah, we were kind of chatting about this slide um, earlier, and it's interesting to look at from different lenses, right? So when you look at it from a technical brewing standpoint, 
there are a lot of aspects uh, of the chemistry of the beer that make it very stable. But then what do we even mean by stable? So you're really looking at, to me, you're looking at free from pathogens, right? It's not going to go bad in, in a sense that it's not going to make you sick. You put a salad in your fridge um, or orange juice or milk is probably a better example. It's going to go bad <laughs> at a certain point, right? Uh, there's going to be something that gets in there and it's going to spoil. Uh, and, and the reason that beer is really good at not doing that is because it has a relatively low pH, um, generally in the, the low fours, say 4.1 to 4.3, 4.4. Um, and what that's doing is um, inhibiting pathogens from um, establishing in large quantities. Uh, but it's not sour, right? Most beer styles tend to not be sour, even though the pH, you know, you're looking at seven as your um, base for water. Um, then above that base and then um, below that um, acidic. There's low nutrient availability because that yeast is dominated, right? There was a lot of carbohydrates and nutrients and uh, vitamins and minerals that were present in that beer, but the yeast have actually converted a lot of that to the flavors that we're going to be talking about. Um, in return, low carbohydrates, so no sugars, very low sugars or um, small chain sugars, and then probably the biggest alcohol present, right? That's going to um, help stabilize that. There's generally going to be very little oxygen. Um, and then isoalpha acid. So there's hops present, which are going to inhibit um, some of that uh, potential spoilage too, which I, I know I've seen that on um, some of the exams as being a point to touch on too, right? Uh, so when you're looking at stability, when you see all this written or somebody says stability, what do you look at? Are you looking at shelf life? Are you looking at, well, it's not going to make somebody sick? Um, you know, when we talk about uh shelf life particularly at the lower levels we're we're looking more at uh when the beer's flavor profile changes so i would say this concept of stability and specifically as we're talking about it here it's like microbiological stability is probably something that we'd focus on more at like a, an advanced or master level um but i honestly I almost think it's more interesting just like thinking about just thinking about stability as a as a lens to view like historical beer production through or or beer production generally because I, I you know a lot of times I think people focus on what what are beer spoilers what things grow in beer um, you know it's definitely something we test on what can happen that can make a beer taste off from a, a microbiological perspective and we focus on this these small groups of different organisms that can grow in beer while sort of ignoring the fact that like not very much can grow in beer just because of all of these things you know it is a the the line that i've always quoted is no known human pathogen can grow in beer there's nothing that can grow in a finished beer that can make you sick and it's it's one of the things that i think uh you know is really interesting about how beer developed historically, you know, going back hundreds of years when water wasn't necessarily safe to drink, where beer would have been safer to drink because of the way it was produced and then all of these other characteristics rendering, rendering it relatively stable against uh, pathogens. So I don't know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rabbit holes you could go down there. I would say one of the most, one area where, uh, some of these elements definitely come into play, especially I would say as low as maybe like upper certified Cicerone, low advanced Cicerone level of knowledge is how brewers can use different parameters to steer lambic fermentations. And I think um, a lot of a lot of people look at lambic fermentation, lambic being the style in Belgium that's made using spontaneous fermentation where you're just inoculating the wort with the microorganisms that happen to be in the air. I think a lot of people look at it as sort of this like mystical free for all thing where it's just like, yeah, you know, they just do it and they get lucky and it just, it happens to work. And, um, and I've seen also some younger or newer breweries here in the U S taking a stab at spontaneous beer and basically treating that way. Like, yeah, you just, you know, you leave it out and it, 
develops and hopefully it develops all right. And uh, you know, from talking to people that have been making the style for a long time, the brewer does exercise a lot of control over those things like using different levels of iso acid in order to basically select for the organisms that are going to be able to grow in that wort. So that's, you know, maybe a more practical application of stability that I think definitely influences that set of styles. So what about um, the role oxygen plays? Uh, because I, I would assume you're in the same boat that I am that while beer is, uh, as you said, microbiologically stable, most beers on a shelf is not very stable. And most bad beer that that I purchase or have tried really has nothing to do with it being brewed poorly it has to do with it not being very shelf stable. So uh, maybe you could touch on that aspect of stability for a second. Um, and I would say oxygen is definitely a huge culprit there. So, you know, uh, I guess I would agree with you that most of the bad beer that I experience is, is not necessarily a result of what happened in a, in a brewery, but a result of what happened in the supply chain. And that is something that we focus on a lot at the lower levels of the program, you know, keeping beer cold to help limit the impacts of oxidation. Um, it sort of plays into this, but, you know, keeping draft lines clean so that you're not having those few spoilage bacteria that can grow in beer you're not having those growing in your draft lines. Um, keeping beer away from light so that it doesn't develop light stark flavors. Uh, but I would say that in the trade, oxidation is probably the, the thing that I encounter most frequently. And that is, it is partially a supply chain issue, but it is, it does also to an extent come back to the brewery. You know, you can take, if you have beer made at a smaller brewery that has less access to high-tech packaging equipment versus a larger brewery that has a lot better process controls, you can subject those two beers to the same set of conditions. Uh, and the one that has been produced in a more controlled man manner and maybe has been packaged with a lower amount of dissolved oxygen, like that one's gonna hold up a lot better. So. So it still does come down to the brewery a, a little bit, but we focus at Cicerone since we're, uh, since the program's not geared necessarily towards technical brewing, we do focus a lot on what can you do regardless of where you work in the industry to help prevent beer from developing these flavors once it is in the package. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it takes this conversation with people in many different sides of the industry. Um, you know, we tend to surround ourselves a lot by um, people with similar positions and, and similar interests. And we're all looking at beer, but there's so many, again, there's so many different angles of looking at the same problems. And if we're not, you know, if, if the conversation ends at the bright tank and then on the canning line, then we're doing ourselves a, a huge disservice as an industry and as consumers um, to fully understand our product and understand how we can um, treat it to where it's going to be uh, maintain the highest quality. Keep it cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a. It's like the, the easiest. That's the easiest thing is like keep it cold before you drink it, <laughs> before like once it leaves the brewery, keep it cold. And ro proper rotating. That's the, probably my number one thing that drives me nuts. Oh, man. I have all sorts walking, of stories. <laughs> walking into a, a beer store that has every beer you could ever think of. You know, I've, I've been the purchaser at a couple bottle shops and restaurants before. And I've always had the attitude of it's okay to run out because that means you're getting the freshest beer from the distributor in hopes that they're getting the freshest beer from the brewery. But when something's always in stock and that's the attitude and you're going to have it, bring it in no matter what and make sure it's always, you know, five cases deep, it's very difficult to properly rotate that and ensure that the, the beer is highest quality, even though microbiologically it's stable. And a lot of times that's what people are thinking, right? Well, it's not going to go bad. It's not going to make people sick, but 
I was I not taste, taste the way it's, either. Yeah. I mean, I think even just paying attention to day codes and rotating is is a thing that is not well enough taught or or understood. I did a training for a grocery chain and had been shopping for beer at that grocery chain like a couple of weeks earlier. And I, I remember I was trying to pick up some uh, an IPA to take to a friend out in California. And I was like, well, I want to make sure it's super fresh and like I grabbed a six pack off and I looked at it and it was eight weeks old. And I was like, eh, that's maybe like beyond where I wanted to be. I was like, oh, but they've, they've got uh, another stack of it over here. I'll take a look there. And it was five weeks old. And I was like, okay, maybe. And then there was another shelf of it. And I like took a look and it was one week old. And I was like, all right, well, I'm taking like the fact that they had beer from three drastic, like three pretty different dates just on the shelf you know you're not you, you're going to deplete those at an equal rate and then at the end you're going to have some of that oldest beer still kicking around and that's just like simple fifo first in first out sort of stuff that i think people don't pay enough attention to that's totally. not about yeast but <laughs> but it is, is a pet peeve for sure but it is about flavor right so that yeah. kind of um segues into we're, we broke this down into talking about positive and negative flavor because i think um from the yeast side, off flavors is what people enjoy talking about the most. I don't quite understand it. Uh, I understand wanting to under, to acknowledge undesirable flavors and where they come from, but the the vigor sometimes that people, the interest level uh, is baffling. But if you have enough um, tainted beer that you've had through sensory and different classes and stuff, it's, it can be pretty off-putting. But let's talk about the positive for a minute. So there's over 500 flavor and aroma compounds contributed um, or impacted by yeast um, to beer. And there's a, a big range there. And it, it's really dependent on uh, beer styles when we're talking about finished beer, right? I think it's easy to break down some of these um, major characteristics simply by looking at categories of beer styles, because some beer styles, some are appro appropriate and some they're not. But it's important to know in most beer styles, most of these compounds are present. They might just not be um, in levels that are above threshold, meaning you might not be able to taste it directly. But even when things are below threshold, they kind of form um, a matrix effect and can support each other and um, create new flavors and aromas that you might not directly get um, from, say, you know, three ppm of isoamyl acetate you know where it's straight banana or and very obvious and what that is but if it's just below threshold it might um, lend itself to something else so um it obviously probably depends on the level of your program but how much do these different compound flavor compounds that are that are yeast derived matter and uh, what would be the easiest uh, first entry level step to learning about them through different beer styles? Uh, I'll, I would say they matter a lot. Um, and do we click answer live if we want to answer a question? Is that how that works? I figured this would be a, a good time to take this question about uh, yeast forward beers. Uh, just go ahead and answer it and I'll take care of it on my end. Okay, sounds good. So um, I would say, especially at the lower levels of the program, we're, we're talking about these from the get-go. We're just not necessarily using their compound names. We're not calling it isoamyl acetate, we're calling it banana. We're not calling it 4-vinyl glycol, we're calling it clove. So for particularly for certified beer server level, the main focus on yeast there is understanding what sorts of flavors yeast can bring to beer. And we kind of break that down into, at that level at least, ester flavors and phenol flavors. Like I said, we don't name them those things, but we talk about fruity sorts of flavors like banana, apple, pear, cherry, peach, or sort of like spicy flavors like black peppercorn, clove, nutmeg, those sorts of things. So um, from the get-go, we're, we're talking about these flavors and how they impact beer. When you get to certified Cicerone, you know, we start to, focus in a little bit more on a wider range of different flavor attributes that can come from yeast. And we do start to use more technical terminology. And then I would say that only continues as, as we go on, you know, once you get to advanced Cicerone, 
we're expecting you to know a number of different esters, uh, like understanding their flavors and how they're formed specifically by name and, and sort of through, through that lens. Um, and I will take this question really quick. Uh, Santiago asked about outside of esters and phenols from Weizen, what other very yeast forward beers exist and, and what specific flavors do the strains bring out? Um, I would say that most ale styles outside of the US have pretty significant uh, yeast contribution. You know, the other, the other one that people often point to as being very yeast forward is, is kind of just generally Belgian styles of beer. And as I'm sure Eric could speak to, there's a tremendous range of different types of yeast that can be used to produce those beers. In general, there are gonna be higher ester producers, higher phenol producers, um, and maybe higher fusel pr producers as well. Um, English styles of beer are also usually, those, those strains typically are producing fair amount of esters and in some cases leaving more diastole behind than you would find in other styles of beer. Diastole is another flavor, you know, it's kind of buttery, butterscotch sort of flavor that in a lot of contexts is considered to be a negative or off flavor sort of thing, but is crucial to certain styles. Mostly, you know, a lot of, I think of like English bitters um, or Czech premium pale lager, Pilsner or Kell. That's like diastole is essential. And that's something that's derived from the yeast that they use. So, um, you know, having an understanding of that, being able to speak to what sorts of fermentation flavors exist in, in different styles and, you know, how much of that is driven by yeast selection, how much is driven by the way that the brewer treats the yeast to get it to produce those flavors. Those are probably the things that we focus on. Yeah. Um, kind of tying in this next question, uh, what's the best way to differentiate yeast aromas from hop aromas? Um, learning how to define yeast character can be uh, a little difficult. Like there are certain styles, obviously, um, as Pat mentioned, that are really obviously expressive um, and have a lot of yeast uh, contribution, especially um, any uh, phenol positive strains. So a lot of those Belgian beers, that's a little bit easier to distinguish because cracked black pepper or, um, you know, some clove elements in a beer are uh, pretty easy to pinpoint. But when we're talking about fruit, right, hops are also really fruity. So how do you distinguish uh, between the two? I'll let you take a stab at this one and then I'll, I'll give you my answer on it. <laughs> You're gonna just throw me to the wolves with this one. It's this is this <laughs> well, is a hard. question. Well, it, it is. This is a question that uh, you know one of our uh, one of our courses geared towards the first level beer savvy boot camp. Um, we break down a number of foundational styles and we talk about what's the malt flavor, what's the hot flavor, what's the yeast flavor, and almost every time I get that question, it's like, okay, well, this is sort of like in this fruity realm, but hops can be fruity. So how do I know which it's coming from? And my short answer is it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, as a beer drinker, if you're able to pick apart the beer and understand the flavors that are present, knowing exactly where they come from is sort of an academic exercise. It's more important if you're brewing the beer and you're trying to say like, we want to dial up this flavor. What do we need to do in order to, to make that change and, and bring this flavor out? But in the context of like talking to somebody uh, about a beer, like if, if they're like, well, did this come from the yeast or, or the hops? Like it's not, the important fact is that the flavor is there. Um, but if you want to like, <laughs> What's the best way to differentiate between the two? Um, for me, and this is once again, like the more technical and more nerdy answer is like, it comes down to specific flavor compounds. Like I've been fortunate to do a lot of training with flavor spikes. And so I can tell you, or I can specifically identify like isoamyl acetate or ethyl acetate or ethyl butyrate, ethyl hexanoate, like all of these different specific yeast 
driven esters. So when I pick those up in a beer, it's not like, oh, this is generally fruity. I wonder what that comes from. It's this is isoamyl acetate that's coming from the yeast versus other sorts of fruity notes that, you know, just through experience, it's like, well, I, I can associate that more with this family of hops. So in, in part, it, it's an experience thing if you like really want to get into it. But um, like I said, at the lower levels, I usually say, I, I don't think it matters. I think what matters most is that you can identify the flavor in the beer rather than knowing exactly where it comes from. Yeah, that's completely fair. Um, you know, where I see it becoming really difficult, I think, yeah, understanding specific beer styles is probably the easiest, knowing that you're not likely to find um, a lot of hop aroma in X beer, say like a just the Belgian double that you usually wouldn't get that. So if it's fruity, you can deduce that it's probably yeast derived, but where it becomes very difficult and why I like this question is because um, hazy beers have really blurred that line. And I've found it very interesting to look at our, so our brewery is, is set up a little bit different and um, we've got a, a, a 20 barrel brew house with 16 five barrel fermenters. And what we do is we split batch uh, for, to perform R and D, but we're also trying to make tasty beer and say we have a, a hazy IPA we're doing and we'll put two different yeast strains in it. So it gives you almost a control um, especially if you understand one of those yeast strains really uh, intimately and, and what the expression of that yeast strain is or isn't um, to compare the other beer with. And so in that context, it's really, it's easier to distinguish what's yeast derived and what's not because you, again, have that base that you can compare it to. Um, but a lot of hazy beers tend to be uh, using yeast strains that are like a medium uh, flavor expression. And so a lot of times people are enjoying these and thinking they're the hoppiest beers they've ever had, which I kind of get a smirk because, you know, I'm like a lot of that's actually the yeast or it's the way the yeast is affecting those hop compounds, which is um, a whole nother discussion. A, a good way of doing it too, if you're not sure, and it is, um, and you have a six pack, let one age for a couple months because a lot of those hop compounds are going to degrade a lot quicker and what you'll be left with is any yeast expression. And so I found uh, a lot of beers. Um, so we just did um, a full shelf life test of our West Coast IPA. It was the first beer we canned. Um, we ran this through panel uh, every week for the first month and then every other week um, moving forward. And I believe we went to 120 days on it. And what we found was the cow ale, the American type strain that's very clean allowed a lot of hop aroma to come through. It didn't mask any of it, but the East Coast strain, which is more of an English strain, produced this awesome uh, like marmalade citrus type note uh, that balanced a lot of the hop character. And both were good and both were good for very different reasons. But at 90 days, the hop aromatics of the Cal California yeast like was really diminished and it was a, a flat, beer aromatically like it, it was, tasted okay but it it didn't have that um depth that it did when it was fresh but the east coast ale yeast was still interesting we were still trying it and saying okay there are you know some technically flawed notes of oxidation and in, in, in the malt but there's still interesting aromatics here and there's still structure and it was cool to see side by side because age really showed that so i would suggest if you're unsure age it for a couple months and see how it smells then try to document it though right take notes and then and see what uh what stands out to you a couple months later well, and i think that that's a really in interesting point and another kind of wrinkle to it is that when you talk about these really heavily dry hopped beers um new england ipa specifically like some of the flavor that you're getting is yeast transformation of hop compounds and so do you call that the flavor do you call that flavor coming from the hop or from the yeast? like it's at, at that point it's like a semantics question more mm -hmm. more than anything it's an it's an interaction of the two so in some ways it's impossible to to totally split apart yeah 
um, just for time's sake, we'll kind of, I want to get to the, uh, the undesirable slide, but, you know, some other aspects of uh, yeast and influence you might see would be um, the bottle conditioning, uh, possibly affecting mouthfeel, against stability, right? And what do we mean, mean by stability? We probably mean flavor in that case. It's going to hold up a little bit longer and scavenge any uh, present oxygen. Um, and then secondary fermentation, uh, meaning like generally adding um, another organism or wild organism. Uh, in this case, Britannomyces is what we're going to commonly see. Um, and we can touch on that again if we have more time at the end. But I really wanted to talk about the the negative aspect because I think diacetyl is always something that's really fun to talk about. Um, probably sulfur, to be honest, is probably a little bit more prominent in the sense that it can be undesirable in most beer styles, but at certain quantities in others, um, it can be pleasant and to be expected. So aside from oxidation, which I feel like we've touched on quite a bit, um, fermentation derived off flavors are a leading cause um, of off beer. And the more knowledgeable and the better your understanding is on these different compounds of when they're supposed to be present and when they aren't, it, it almost can ruin beer for you. Uh, because I, I'm personally not a fan of diacetyl uh, in almost any beer style whether technically appropriate in some or not. Um, but I don't mind it in low levels in a California Chardonnay. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah I mean, it's, I, somebody mentioned this in the comments is like, because I said it in, in one of the other, one of the tasting together videos that I did probably the one on, on Czech premium pale lager, but like I am pretty diastole intolerant. It's not a flavor. It's, it's a flavor that when it's not supposed to be there, I'm like, can't do it for whatever reason for styles that I like understand that it's supposed to be there my brain's like no it's fine don't worry about it like I love Pilsner Kel I I think once again like if it gets to be too high in a in like an English bitter it's like no that's not appropriate but low level I'm like yeah this is this is what they're shooting for so and I, I don't know if that's just some weird trick of the brain. It certainly could be. Expectation plays a lot into our, our flavor experience, but. Sure. Uh, so what are some compounds that you might also see um, that would be important to know at different levels um, of the different exams? Um, you know, I think if you, one thing I didn't mention up front, every level of the program has a specific syllabus for it. And in the syllabus, in the section on flavors, like we lay out the flavors that we expect you to know. So if you're looking at certified Cicerone syllabus or advanced or master, there's a list there of the different sorts of flavor compounds that you're expected to know some about. And we also identify the ones that you want to be able to identify specifically by taste, like in the tasting exam. Um, you know, I'd say at certified Cicerone level, primary focus would be some of the more prominent ones like diastole, acetaldehyde, um, you know, DMS comes up there as well. A as you, as you go on just a deeper and wider range of, of different flavor compounds, getting into specific phenols, specific esters, um, specific acids, those sorts of things. Awesome. And the, the, you know, I think a good way of looking at it is you can really get in the weeds with different compounds and, and trying to quickly you know, do attribute training, but really it's like, just look at what's prominent um, and learning what your gaps are. Cause I think that's, you know, the most difficulty is sensory is something that and not even off flavors, you know, off flavors to the side, but sensory is something that you have to continue to practice. And I've, I've heard from people who are respected in the industry say, you know, I, I've done that before. I don't, I'm, I'm good. Right. And it's like, I, I don't understand that attitude because it's like any muscle. If you don't continue to use it, you're going to lose it. And without that constant training and, and challenging yourself, you can memorize things all day, but um, that palate memory is something that needs to be exercised. 
Sensory is a practice sport. I, you know, and I, I could not agree more. You know, I've done tons and tons of, of attribute training and, and other training, but it's still like, if I haven't been working on it for a while, like during pandemic times where I haven't been out doing trainings or mm -hmm. anything, like I would imagine, or I, I know my, I'm not as sensitive as, as I would other be wise be the, like, it, it's most clear for me. Uh, we do a lot of work with Aroxa flavor spike company out of the UK and Bill Simpson, the leader there does these five day courses and they would do them at the Cicerone offices or like host them there occasionally. Um, when I would sit in on one of those classes where I would do basically like eight hours of flavor training a day for five days, the two or three weeks after that course, it'd be like, Oh my, like, peak sensitivity. That's the, I've, I've taken that course twice. And the couple of weeks coming out of that course is like, it, it, I would have notably different experience with beers that I was familiar with even because I was so like, so tuned up and more sensitive to those things. Um, you absolutely, it's a practice thing. And if you, even if you've learned it a hundred times like if you don't use it you do lose it for sure mm -hmm. yeah and, and just taste everything you're consuming and you can look for some of those characteristics in other products i mean we all consume a lot of fermented products and we might not think about it right if you're putting vinegar on something taste it like just like you should be tasting every ingredient you're cooking with like go to your uh, pantry and your spice cabinet and and look for those different characteristics and relate it um, back to beer. You know, I had a cup of yogurt this morning and a lot of Greek yogurt has a lot of diacetyl. And why does it have a lot of diacetyl? Well, it uses a lot of the same organisms that might be in a sour beer. So it's not uncommon to see some of those compounds translate to other products and just continuing to challenge yourself doesn't mean that it always needs to be through beer or through a hundred dollar spike kit, you know, pick something up off the shelf or that's been left in your back of your fridge for longer than it should and uh, analyze it, right? We have access to a lot of um, different types of products and it's not always, it doesn't always need to be a formalized sit down sensory course to do it. It's, it, it's a really awesome point. And it's one of those things that I often will say to people is like, you know, you can learn a lot by just paying a little bit more attention to what you're already consuming by just thinking about it a little bit more. And for some people, they don't necessarily want to do that. And that's fine. Like the goal of life is not to have everybody be super tuned in to all of these specifics and nuances of flavor. But if it is something that you're interested in, if it is something like if you want to get better at identifying flavors, paying a little bit more attention, being a little bit more thoughtful when you're consuming things will teach you so much. And especially consuming things outside of beer will teach you things that will come into play when you come back to beer. So couldn't agree more. Awesome. On that note, to kind of wrap up what we were talking about, um, you know, fermentation is arguably the most important aspect of beer production, but often the most misunderstood. And I think that goes to the uh, simplest terms. We were having a meeting uh, internally here yesterday and it was, you know, talking about a restaurant. And I was like, well, a lot of people don't know that we're um, a yeast producer as well. And it's, you know, a lot of that language sometimes can become a little heady. And um, like you said, focusing on the flavors as opposed to, you know, cell counts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As opposed to like why, how those flavors come to be, while that's really important, you need to have that base understanding first of um, what it's actually causing. Cause you can learn the nitty gritty all day, but if you can't understand how to describe or, or pick up what you're actually tasting and why it's there, how it's there. Is, um, and to tie that back to Cicerone quick, I mean, I do think that that is one of the most important things of Cicerone is you are learning a lot, potentially really, really technical information with the goal of being able to boil it down and talk to somebody who doesn't know the first thing about beer to be able to help them have a better beer experience. Like that is, that's the ultimate goal is, 
how can you utilize all of this knowledge, not to show off how much you know, but to make some of these complex concepts accessible and easy for people to understand. Right on. Uh, and then, you know, one thing that I think is cool to look at is you know, we look at beer in the historical context a lot, but it styles are ever changing. Consumer trends are changing. Uh, and a lot of times the types of ingredients that they're using are changing too. So it's important to know that understanding those organisms and how they're playing a role in different beer styles or different beverages um, is, is ever evolving and the information behind that is, is ever evolving. So it's, it's a fun subject to follow and um, the sky's the limit when it comes to knowledge. Um, on that, I definitely wanna thank you uh, for spending some time today. I got a couple other questions that I'll follow up through email. So Tom, um, got your, your question. I'm gonna shoot you an email after this. Uh, but it's always great talking to you. Um, and hopefully pleasure, once, pleasure all mine. Yeah, once uh, we can start traveling a little bit more, we cross paths um, sooner than later. Cause I think there was a couple beers we were planning on this year that ended up not happening. That's uh, that's been the story of 2020, but yes, it, it will be good <laughs> to uh, see you in person when, when that happens again. Awesome. Um, if anybody's looking for it, they'll get an email in the next 24 hours with more information on Cicerone and how to access that, um, as well as a link to our YouTube channel to view this and share it with anybody that you might think finds it interesting. Um, with that, I thank you again, Pat, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank everybody for joining. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye.